Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Kevin Quinn, and it's my pleasure today to introduce the moderator of today's panel, Vice Admiral William Hilardis, the commander of Naval Sea Systems Command, or NAVC, as we say. After graduating from the Naval Academy in 1981, Admiral Hilardis went on to a distinguished career as a submarine officer, serving in both, fa both fast attack and ballistic missile submarines. The highlight of his operational career was command of USS Key West, SSN 722. Since becoming an acquisition professional in 2002, he has served as Director, Advanced Submarine Research and Development, Program Manager for the SSGN Program, and Program Executive Officer for Submarines. He assumed command of NAVC on 7 June 2013, and now oversees a global workforce of 56,000 civilian and military personnel responsible for the development, delivery, and maintenance of Navy ships, submarines, and systems. As a former commander of the Naval Surface Force Atlantic, I can tell you that there is no command more important to surface force readiness than NAVC. And I couldn't be happier that NAVC is in the hands of such an inspiring leader and consummate professional. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Vice Admiral William Hilardis. Well, thanks, Kevin. I, I appreciate it. Very, thanks for that uh, very kind introduction. I, I'd like to first acknowledge the Surface Navy Association. Uh, kind of admired from afar over the last uh, 31 years or so of my career. Uh, now I feel like I'm, I'm home, and I, I very much appreciate everything the Surface Navy Association does uh, for our Navy, particularly our Surface Navy. And I have to say the only thing missing from the agenda is a clam bake. So uh, <laughs> you have to go to Groton to figure, what, figure out what that one meant. Um, I'd also like to start by thanking uh, many of you, uh, both on the industry side and on the government side, for everything that was done over the last uh, three and a half, uh, now almost four months, uh, since the terrible tragedy in the Navy Yard. Uh, we uh, found ourselves uh, homeless, almost 2,700 uh, NAVC, uh, predominantly civilians, but civilian and military folks, uh, wandered around M Street, literally, uh, looking for a place to work. Uh, what was brought home uh, in the immediate aftermath was how much the Navy needs NAVC and how much, uh, how important our headquarters is to the execution of the daily business of the Navy. And to each of you who either hosted some part of our workforce, uh, helped them out just in the, in the matter of their daily business, uh, I just want a, a sincere thank you uh, from all of us. Uh, uh, the, uh, the workforce is uh, almost to its new normal. Uh, we crossed over 2,000 uh, folks uh, moving into the temporary facility down at Buzzards Point. Thank you. I know there were some Coast Guard officers here. Uh, thank them for vacating our, our building uh, just in time for us. And, uh, and I'll, I'll just highlight, normal to, uh, to the average person who used to work in Building 197 is a desk, a phone, a computer that has a reasonable bandwidth to NMCI that you know you're going to show up at every day when you come to work. And we still have about 500 who haven't quite gotten a new normal. We're really close. Uh, and, uh, and again, thank you for everything you've done. I also have to acknowledge I could not be more proud of those people, those great Americans, who gutted through uh, some of the most difficult times that I can imagine. And, and uh, 916 happens to fall about two weeks prior to the end of a fiscal year. Uh, the NAVC books uh, almost $28 billion uh, matters a lot to the Navy uh, and the Department of Defense how NAVC finishes a fiscal year. And uh, the contracting workforce, the budget financial workforce, the program management folks did an amazing amount. Used to have a, a tot up of all the things we accomplished in that last two weeks, but it included delivery of a ship and almost $1.6 billion in contracts uh, that were done. Uh, from that virtual headquarters scattered all around M Street and the rest of Washington. So, so uh, uh, and, then, and then I would be remiss if I didn't remind you all, uh, we can never forget those 12 great Americans that were killed on 916. I, I visited with uh, uh, 
almost all the families, I still have two left uh, over the holidays, they're, they're doing well and they really appreciate the support that many of you uh, uh, put out to them. Uh, the, uh, I, I will specifically acknowledge, uh, I won't acknowledge the organizations that asked not to be acknowledged, but some of the organizations that gathered up resources and de distributed to the families did a great job. The families are very appreciative of everything everyone did to help them, so thank you. Uh, I'll, uh, the reason I start with that is in the middle of that, about a week and a half after uh, 916, a box showed up into my temporary office. Uh, I was using MSC's conference room uh, as my office. It's a beautiful big wood table with VTC and it was my office, literally. And, uh, and a box shows up and Pat Dolan comes in and goes, the strategic business plan is done. So the, the business plan, the color glossy that you, many of you have seen, uh, was finished printing. Now we had decided what that business plan was gonna be. Uh, the team had signed off on it. Uh, well before the 916, but the printer delivered it uh, shortly thereafter. So we got the leadership team together and we did a quick review of the, of the tenets of that strategic business plan and decided as a team that it still met the mark, that it was still where we wanted to take NAMC over these next few years and that although we'd had a temporary diversion, that those uh, business plan elements were the critical business plan, uh, the critical things that we thought we needed to get done uh, over the course of the next, uh, of my tenure at NAVC, and of course I hope it endures past that. Uh, the tenants of it, I think uh, we have a chart, if I can get the next chart up, uh, are fairly straightforward, and I think that for this conference, the first title, It's All About the Ships, is really the essence of the strategic business plan. And, and what our panel today, uh, we have uh, uh, Admiral Dave Gale is gonna talk about our efforts to go really uh, uh, continue the progress made on improving surface ship maintenance and modernization. It really should have those words in there now that I look at it. Uh, the shipboard preventive maintenance is interesting. We did a uh, reduction in administrative distractions drill uh, and PMS came up again, just like it does about every few years. Uh, and the sailor said, boy, PMS is hard and it's cumbersome and everything else. Uh, Mark Whitney's gonna talk about our efforts to streamline the system, to make sure we have the right maintenance in the PMS system, and that we've made it as easy as possible for those sailors to do the maintenance that's required on their equipment uh, uh, at that level uh, to make these ships last uh, for the longest period. And then the third part about it, about it, about uh, it's all about the ships is war fighting system commonality. That has been the principal job of the Integrated Warfare System PEO since it was created, and Joe Horn will talk about our efforts in that area. Uh, the other two areas I'll just touch on briefly before I turn it over to the other panel members. Uh, technical excellence and judiciousness, and what's highlighted in that, in that uh, title is the and. It is very, very difficult to be technically excellent, but we have achieved that. Our, our technical folks at NAVC and in the supporting commands are the best at what they do in the world to be technically excellent and judicious. That is to bring cost into the equation, to think about uh, the, the places where the requirements we put on to be excellent are driving us out of business in many cases. And then figure out how to quantify the risk, present that risk to the war fighters and the fleet commanders and say, hey, are you willing to take on this risk? We're willing to recommend that you do. Here are the things we think you should do. That and is the essence of that of that topic and, and it really comes down to, you know, we wrote the curves when we talk about the knee and the curve. The requirements curves were, were made by the technical folks uh, at NAVC with our industry partners. And so to ask the fleet where, the, where to set the requirement, we should be coming in and saying, no, if you'd reduce that requirement by this amount, that's where the knee and the curve is, where the, you can save a bunch of costs and get ni the 95% solution or the 80% solution if we decide that that's where it should be. Uh, the other part of that technical excellence is really about our workforce. Uh, as many of you know, we took about a 15 year hiring hiatus and that demographic is still in our workforce. And so our most excellent folks, the people who are at the top of those pyramids, there's about a 15 year gap in experience between them and their replacement. I worry about that gap a lot as those uh, senior civilians uh, predominantly move uh, to their to uh, inevitable retirement, 
I'm told that we'll all get there eventually, um, that we lose that essence of what makes us technically excellent. And so we're investing and in investigating ways to go both accelerate the knowledge, transfer across that gap, and of course to use modern learning uh, to go help with the experience part, which is very hard to build 15 years experience designing ships when you're not designing ships. And so that'll be a tremendous challenge to, to, the, to us as we move forward. The last one is sort of a no-brainer in the current fiscal environment. Uh, by every measure, the next uh, three to five years are going to be in flat to declining budgets. And so our ability to go control the costs of everything we buy and control the cost of everything we modernize uh, will be critical. Uh, I think that there's, uh, uh, in the challenging the requirements, and again, that's partly in the mirror, Pentagon owns the requirements, but we do all the work below them. Uh, that's, that's work for us to tee up uh, for the Pentagon. I think there's an organizational piece. Uh, Admiral Roden and I have been working on this. How do we go bring the right level of decision makers together present those opportunities and then decide them. And really, I'll say internal to the surface Navy, because predominantly uh, the, the things that'll come up are surface uh, related. And, and the SCIB was how we used to do that. We used to have a good conversation about requirements and cost in the SCIB. It probably won't be called the SCIB, but the SCIB ID is what that was after. And then uh, in the mac maximizing across platforms, we talk about it a lot. And uh, predominantly across platforms results in either the way you build the ship or the way you modernize it, being made, being it, be it uh, making it common between ship classes. Uh, we stood up a new code at NAVC, NAVC 06. We kind of recycled the number, but uh, the new, and, and it is its predominant job, NAVC 06, led by my vice commander, Admiral Tom Kearney, will be about that cross-platform commonality. It will require teamwork between my four shipbuilding PEOs and, and the main body of NAVC. And again, that's a team. Uh, there's, there's a, it's a shared responsibility. But my PEOs are committed to, to going and bringing that into the new construction side. And then in the modernization, we'll work uh, those commonality initiatives as well. So that's the essence of our, of our strategic business plan. And, and uh, now we'll move to a, a panel discussion I think that this panel, and, and predominantly, I think Admiral Gortney set it off last night. We are going to take back control of the ship's schedules. For Admiral Gortney and the fleet commanders to have control of the ship's schedules means we have to get our maintenance and modernization done as predicted. That is, start on time, finish on time, uh, and, do, and do it in a cost-effective way. And so I think it's very, very appropriate as we really stand up our ability at NAVC to coordinate both maintenance and modernization, bring those two things to the table and to the fleet commander, and, and then execute that maintenance and modernization in a, in a coherent way that I think the panel is, uh, is uh, well prepared to, to uh, discuss that. And so I think first we'll talk, uh, we'll have Admiral Dave Gale talk about improving service ship maintenance. Dave? Sure. Good morning, folks. Uh, it's a great uh, pleasure to be here with you again. And as I uh, prepared for this event, I uh, reflected on the four-plus years that I've been grinding away at this business uh, and, and making incremental progress that it's probably the fourth SNA event. It is some form or another I've been able to speak to you about uh, the business we're in and uh, some of the challenges we face. Um, the first slide that's up here right now should not be new to anybody who has been at any of the previous engagements with me on this business. Uh, if I could reflect for a moment, um, when Admiral Harvey commissioned what was referred to as the Bilal Report, and there was some, some, um, some deep and thorough look at the business of ship readiness and, and how surface maintenance and modernization played in some of that, uh, I was tasked by then Vice Admiral McCoy to go understand and start codifying and displaying the gaps and start working on those issues. And I'm happy to say that four years later, the story remains unchanged, that we understand what challenges the business uh, from end to end. The one modification in this slide that I will, uh, I will confess is that we started out with five big rocks. But as I started to uh, apply uh, whatever heat and light I could apply to uh, an organization that involved over 
uh, probably close to 6,000 civilians and sailors and that many more private sector uh, wrench turners that there was a missing piece that we needed to get at and it's the sixth rock on the right called alignment and oversight. And today I would tell you that alignment and oversight is probably the single biggest uh, challenge before us as we consider how many different organizations there are in this business that have some effect on whether or not we plan it right and execute it right in the form of stabilizing a requirement, flowing money into the process at the right time to do proper planning and to be able to execute to a schedule that we all agreed to at the beginning. We are, uh, we are challenged in that area and Vice Admiral Hillard has mentioned that uh, there's an awful lot of interest uh, and certainly NAFC is going to be helping lead the way in what it's going to take to get that right. I'm going to quickly uh, update you on the six rocks. Uh, assessment uh, uh, plan and policy, a program known as Total Ship Readiness Assessment, a term pulled right out of the submarine playbook, fully resourced, let me say that again, fully resourced to the man day to execute assessments on every ship that's in the program for assessments. It is not under resourced by one minute or one dime for full execution. The challenge in it is, and we're working with the type commanders on this and uh, Admiral Bill Galinas on the RMC side to make sure that it is aligned with the ship schedules in the SFRM, Ships uh, Readiness Manual. Uh, that is, uh, I'll say, uh, some uh, early learning ground for us. Uh, the program was challenged a little bit in FY13 when we slowed down spending on the OMEN side. Uh, it did put some perturbations into the full implementation, implementation of TISRA. But again, it's a fully resourced program in 14 and out. Uh, so we do not lack for resourcing or uh, process to go do uh, assessments. And as we know, s assessments done right and done at the right time better inform a work package. Very important. Sustainment program. Uh, not as much progress on this one as I would like, but I, it maybe uh, just took as long as it would take for me to eventually maybe become C21 uh, to, uh, to to move this one a little further down the road. This one's about a grouping or aligning all of the resources uh, for life cycle management of, of systems and equipments uh, and how they uh, perform in platforms into a common program that looks across all surface ships, all systems, and that we're doing the right life cycle activities to fight our way through obsolescence or maybe readiness challenges in the way systems are designed and performed so we can go and approve that. Uh, so uh, I told Admiral Roden uh, that uh, my intentions are to single it all up uh, and uh, so that when we talk diesels, for instance, that it's not just amphib diesels, that it's diesels across all surface ships, for instance. So that's sustainment program. SurfMet. Um, I cannot say enough about what we've done uh, in this investment in SurfMap. This is bedrock. Uh, this is engineered requirements to do the right maintenance, the right deep maintenance at the right time to be able to deliver on an, an expected service life of a platform that we envisioned when we engineered it at the beginning. It gets 35, 40, 45. Even if we changed our plan and said we needed to take out take a platform out five more years. We now have the capability to go look hard with right engineering rigor on exactly what it's going to take to get five more years out of a ship. These, these are bedrock requirements. Um, nearly every ship uh, in the surface Navy is in the program. There are some exceptions. We're not making investment in, uh, in FFGs and uh, you know LCS DG 1000 are coming in on the left hand side. Uh, but I think uh, I would uh, I'd be able to say that by mid-year 14, uh, we're on a glide path that we have every ship that can be in the program in the program, and that about a third of those ships have either completed their first engineered maintenance availability or are in the process of planning for the execution of that availability. And this is one where we just need to stay the course. The leadership of SurfMap is, is solid. The processes are solid. Much of it, if not... Well, there are some exceptions. I'll say much of the process is lifted right out of the submarine playbook at SubMEP, uh, and uh, it is going. It, these requirements are flowing into the budget process. Every ship's requirement is treated equally and the same in that process. Every man day of required engineered maintenance that we have asked for in that process, we have gotten a budget to go execute that. Now, in the year of execution, what does that really look like in the flowdown? 
that's another debate, but uh, we are succeeding in this area. We are growing the requirement and the budgets are growing right along with it to go execute it. The challenge for us and the thing that I'm working on uh, very, uh, very aggressively is taking advantage of what we know in that requirement, marry it up with the moder program modernization requirement that's coming together for the same availability and telling the fleet early exactly how many days and weeks that's going to take to accomplish all that work. Right now, today, we perform twice as much maintenance in dollar terms from 10 years ago in a notional schedule that's not engineered. We have the know-how today to go engineer the schedule too, and we're going to do that. RMC capability capacity. Uh, Bill Galinas relieved me, uh, you know, still very much climbing, uh, climbing up the curve on restoring the manning uh, in the RMCs to be able to oversee an increasing volume of work with increasing pressure for uh, quality and schedule. Uh, we need to continue to climb that curve. I would tell you that the initial buy three years ago, I think, was 635 additional civilians, and we wanted to regrow the eye-level capabilities in the RMCs by as many as 1,800 sailors. We're continuing to climb that curve. We may not have that number right on the Civ per side especially. Um, and on the sailor side, uh, I would just tell Admiral Road and as many sailors as we can find a way to get into our IMAs, the, the more progress we can make in rebuilding our sailors' capability to maintain ships at sea. Um, so that the RMC capability capacity thing is very, very uh, real. It's an issue. It needs to grow. The budgets are there to support some growth. We may not have that number right. We need to continue to grind on that. Availability execution work certification. Uh, this is kind of the feedback piece. At the end of the avail, did we certify the work that we did to get the quality that we needed? And did we complete all the work that we said we were going to do at the beginning? Did something happen in, uh, in process that took work out for one reason or another that we need to catalog and track? This is bedrock, again, activity for SurfMEP to keep track of all maintenance that was scheduled, uh, all maintenance that was performed, and to keep track of whatever backlog we might be building so that that, too, can build the budget for the next availability. And then last, like I said, the alignment and oversight piece um, is, is, I think, the thing that looms uh, uh, most heavily right now uh, on our business and be able to perform it better. We have too, much, too many people, individuals, all well-meaning, who have the ability to go and make a decision or pull a lever or to destabilize a solid funded requirement, budgeted requirement, in the planning process or in execution that can put any availability over a cliff and in some cases before you ever started. And uh, this is the piece that uh, Admiral Hilardis and, and myself and, and many others, Admiral Rodin's in the team, Admiral Copeman, uh, Admiral Guma Tau Tau, there is a lot of, uh, I'll say, heat and light again on the subject of who is going to be in control and accountable for this process from end to end uh, when it comes to doing it right, uh, tracking it from left to right, uh, and being able to take the face shot in the end if we failed. Uh, and I'm, ha I'm, I'm, I'm peppered with face shots, so uh, uh, it's, a, it's a sport. It's a fun sport. But again, I, I, really, I think for me the visual is, you know, when you succeed, how many people are going to be on the stage with you to get the award? And when you fail, how many people will be on the stage for you when you get shot? And uh, there's always a difference. There's a delta in that game. But, but I, you know, again, I, I, I would certainly be privileged uh, to be the guy who was accountable uh, with all the organizations behind me to go get this done right. But uh, we've got to get that aligned right or I can't win. If we can go to the next slide very quickly. So the alignment piece. You know, today we have uh, two different policies, one maintenance and one modernization in this end-to-end -end process involving two years worth of left side planning before you ever get to day one of execution that is not run very well. The policies are not integrated. The IT applications that we use to I'll say screen, build work packages, plan work packages, integrate work packages between maintenance and modernization are not synchronized today. I will say culturally, we tend to have a divide amongst our, our, uh, our leadership and our workforce on whether they're in the maintenance game or the modernization game. Well, what if we were both in the maintenance and modernization game and we started thinking about it that way from the top down? Uh, that is critical uh, thinking. Uh, that has to play out. What this chart depicts, and I'm not sure if it jumps out at you, but we have policy today on how we're supposed to be planning. We don't follow it. 
what you see on the chart on the right-hand side in the red area is that most of it comes together uh, either in a, uh, I'll say, stabilizing work package, getting it contracted for, uh, and even getting it into, uh, I'll say, on con contract and being it, putting it into execution is happening sometime in around about uh, three months before you start the availability. Uh, a lot of people are showing up, well, where'd you come from? Oh, I'm going to put this new uh, thing on the ship. Oh, no, you're not. Well, today we just uh, we go for the waiver, we put it into the package, and the RMC is left to fix it on the downswing. Very challenging. As I proposed to uh, Admiral Roden and, and Vice Admiral Hilardis and Ad Admiral Copeman, we need to pull this thing to the left. We know at 720 the programmed requirement for maintenance and modernization across many programs we know what we're going to do on an availability. We, under, we can understand and take advantage of the fact that every program has got a fielding profile and that the great work of SurfMEP and OpNav to, to get a budgeted engineered requirement uh, into a work package on availability, we can lock that down and we can plan it and not change it. We can perform in this business. We've just got to decide that we can do that and give the, the right people the right authority to go manage that requirement through this process with a great deal of stability. Uh, that's the game for the future. Um, and uh, I will say one more thing as I close. Uh, SPIM authorities, ship platform manager authorities, we gave it up on our side of the business. Uh, going back to, I'll say, the carrier and submarine examples, they know how to do it. They know how to say no. They know when to say no. They know how to get to yes if you're doing it right. And we need to uh, reestablish SPIM authorities within NAFC C21 on behalf of the fleet and the type commander and every uh, Pathfinder program out there that uh, both uh, Mr. Stackley and, and Admiral Roden are sponsoring uh, to get this plan better. We, we know what we're going to do. We've just got to have the right people overseeing modernization, the disciplines to the modernization planning process such that we can win this game. And with that, I'll uh, turn it over to you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dave. I, I'll just uh, I, I, uh, simplify this down to uh, putting the weight of NAVC behind the cop and the cop. So the cop, the policeman, the sheriff that's going to oversee this and make sure that people follow the rules, or if they don't follow the rules, it's done in public as opposed to in the middle of the night. And then a common operational picture on what's in and what's out, what we're going to get done, how long it's going to take. And I think if we can pull off those two things, uh, we'll have gone a great measure to supporting the OFRP that Admiral Gortney laid out. The other half of this, of course, is the modernization side. Uh, principal modernization provider at NAMC is uh, PEO IWS, and uh, Joe's going to talk a little bit about how we we go bring the uh, bring the modernization piece into the into this uh, topic. Thanks, Admiral. Appreciate it. Uh, before I start, I, I did want to introduce uh, you all a little bit to uh, to PEO IWS. It's uh, it's a PEO that contains about 155 programs, and, uh, and we work with, uh, with probably some of the most professional industry partners in the world. We've got, uh, I've got seven, 13 of the finest program managers and, uh, and 17 of the best captains uh, any flag officer could ask for. We, uh, it, it, without them, uh, none of this commonality would be, uh, would be possible. Indeed, none of the fine development that goes on in IWS would be, uh, would be possible. Our imperative here is, uh, is very simply one, uh, thank you, dealing with, uh, with cost and inefficiency, as well as the efforts that, uh, that we've been hearing over the last couple of days. In terms of cost, uh, by installing multiple different systems designed to do, in essence, common functions across different uh, ship types or different classes of ships, is, is leading us to cost in many arenas. It's leading us to, uh, to cost in, in training. It's leading us to cost in buying different parts. It's leading us to cost in the infrastructure it takes to keep those systems uh, up and sustained. And it's a cost we can no longer afford. Uh, it's also leading to mass inefficiencies. I think uh, Vice Admiral Copeman talked about it a number of times in his presentation about uh, sailors, about having to maintain several different schoolhouses for ostensibly the same, fun the same uh, equipment that functions, that functions or achieves the same function uh, just with, uh, with different piece parts of, uh, of equipment. And then lastly, the mandate that has, uh, that has been voiced very eloquently here by uh, Admiral Gale and Admiral Hilardis, but, uh, but sort of hammered home uh, through the presentations by the Director of Surface Warfare, 
the Commander of Naval Service Forces, and then yesterday by USFF that we have a dedicated period of time that we've got to, we've got to be in uh, in our maintenance, and, or whether it's maintenance, whether it's modernization, we've got to be in and we've got to, be, we've got to meet those timelines. Uh, certainly a common approach with common measures and common equipment sort of increases that predictability and gives us the, uh, the confidence we need to be able to meet that mandate. Uh, the situation that we have is uh, we didn't get here in, uh, in the last 11 months, and it's going to take us a, a, a fair bit of time to do this in a judicious manner. But, uh, but let me give you one example. Uh, C-21 was chartered by uh, uh, Vice Admiral Copeman some time ago to do a navigation study. And, uh, and look at where we were in individual uh, pieces of the navigation suite across multiple classes of ships, and then to focus that examination by strike group. And what we found was daunting. You take any typical strike group that's preparing to deploy and look at the pieces of equipment that do common functions. Inertial navigation, among those 11 ships, we may have four different kinds of INS, three different kinds of speed logs, all of them obsolete, nothing on the drawing board to replace them. Uh, when I say all of them obsolete, the parts that uh, in those have, uh, have uh, uh, significant obsolescence issues. Six different kinds of computer programs driving the, uh, the ECTUS solution, the presentation to the, uh, to the ship's team on how they're going to navigate the ship. So, so uh, we are far from common across those, those uh, arenas and one we have to strive for. The opportunities this gives us are many. First, in terms of development, reduce cost. It is uh, common processes lead to less overhead among our industry partners. So, uh, so therefore, we can do things across multiple ship types, across multiple baselines in a, in, a, in a fashion that is the same and get rid of that overhead. One time pass through through the certification and safety uh, frameworks. And, and I, I don't mean that uh, variations in computer program only have to go through one time, but we can, if we, if we have common uh, uh, baselines, we can then proceed through that framework and only focus on the differences. Right now, to, uh, to get an update to a, uh, to a baseline five Aegis program versus a baseline seven program requires a complete end-to-end -end examination through that framework and something that we've got to, uh, we've got to indeed reduce. Uh, we can leverage this substantial uh, uh, quality of evidence that uh, that we've got to uh, we've got to gather in order to proceed through those certification processes and not have to pay for a gathering of evidence several times in order to carry several different weapon systems through. Training, uh, we could focus our packages again on those differences instead of having to create out of whole cloth a training package and train the sailor, sailors as they proceed to their career in Aegis alone, as they go from baseline to baseline, we owe it to them not to have to do the same function in different manners requiring a different six-week training period. We need, to get, we need to get them through and then focus on those differences and we ought to look to reduce those differences. That comes through vari variance reduction or through commonality. And lastly, testing. Uh, our testing periods are what they are because we have to guarantee our sailors tend to sleep with their ordinance, and we need to make sure that, uh, that those warf warfare systems are safe to operate. So we go, through, we go through an extensive testing regimen, again, as we proceed from baseline to baseline or from ship type to ship type or even among classes of ships, being able to leverage that OQE uh, is, uh, is something that, uh, that provides us a tremendous opportunity in terms, of, uh, in terms of commonality. And lastly, uh, we can look to reduce, uh, we can look to, uh, to focus those reduced dollars that we have to spend to fix the problems that we see in development and fix them once and not have to fix them and discover them across multiple different uh, weapon systems and multiple different classes of ships. The next opportunity is in sustainment. You've heard, uh, again, uh, multiple senior surface warfare leaders uh, here, and, and, uh, and both uh, Admiral Gale and Admiral Hilardis mentioned this morning in terms of uh, training parts and corrective maintenance, uh, variance reduc reduction offers us 
a tremendous opportunity, again, to be able to reduce costs and <clears throat> to stop focusing that, that increased variance on the backs of our sailors. Uh, as a sailor goes through that pipeline again, uh, it, we, we can focus on difference and not, uh, and not recreate the training package for him each and every time he goes through. Uh, the upgrades uh, can support those objectives established by Admiral Gortney in the OFRP and spoken to very eloquently by Admiral Gale here this morning, and that is we have a very focused time period. We need to get in. We need to operate according to that structure. We need to uh, uh, be very transparent. We need to get in and then, uh, and then uh, operate in that to install or modernize in the period of time that we are provided and not be the cause of any delay. Again, commonality or variance reduction provides us that opportunity. There are some potential issues, however, that uh, we're not, I don't want to paint a picture that, uh, that we are proceeding with all haste. We, we certainly are, uh, are working uh, towards, this, towards this effort, but there are some barriers that stand in our way and some efforts that, uh, that we've got to overcome. First is the implementation. Um, when I first started looking at this, uh, and, and those PEOs before me, we have tried various models. We've tried a model where we have, uh, we have demanded a certain uh, piece of equipment and offered that equipment to, uh, to our industry partners as CFE. So they would, uh, in, uh, the shipbuilders would then mandate that in a contract to their shipbuilder. They would procure that piece of equipment and install it in the ship. Um, we've, all, we've looked at a model where GFE is the way to do where my program managers would procure that equipment and then meet the in-yard need date imperatives established by the shipbuilder. Uh, which model is, uh, is the best? In, uh, uh, I, can't, I can't sit here today and tell you with, uh, with a fact the way we should proceed. But one thing is, uh, is for sure, we've got to get to this virtual shelf of commonality where, uh, where a shipbuilder uh, or, the, uh, or the folks that are modernizing can, uh, can know that they can reach to a piece of equipment a common piece of equipment, and whether that equipment is the same, an SPS 73, Victor 16, this is uh, Victor 13, I'm sorry, exactly the same between an LPD 17 install and an Aegis install, or whether the modules inside that surface search radar are exactly the same. Uh, we've got we've to get our arms around that. Uh, we want, again, what the imperative is, is to reduce cost, to, uh, to remove that burden from the backs of our sailors and to make sure that we're, uh, we're in and we're out when we, uh, when we need to be in terms of modernization. So we've got, to, we've got to come through that and examine some of that. One thing we cannot do, we can't perturbate those schedules that, uh, that have been addressed in multiple forums here uh, throughout. We cannot um, reduce performance, and I'll talk to that a little bit. But uh, what, I, what I do worry about in those alternatives that we've looked at and we've tried is um, we cannot increase cost. And that I, I can't, I, I've got to, in a GFE environment uh, where we are procuring those uh, and providing them to our counterpart PEOs, uh, I've got to have competitive pressure to ensure that I, I, my costs are what they are and we're not just uh, a monopoly in providing uh, Admiral Lewis or, uh, or Admiral Moore or uh, Admiral Antonio the, uh, this is what it costs because this is what it costs. We've got to do everything we can to keep those costs to a minimum. But Admiral, as also as Admiral Hart has mentioned, uh, that knee in the curve, I think we've done, we've done an awful lot to examine cost versus requirements and what is good enough, but we've got to do everything we can to continue to keep pressure and reduce that cost. In performance, we've got to create a mentality where we, uh, we, um, we don't get so locked in to, this, to, to commonality that when capability arrives in the ship, it's not pacing the threat. It's common, but we're not pacing the threat across a broad class of ships or a broad swath of, uh, of uh, U.S. Navy uh, capability. Some of the examples that, uh, that where we have achieved success that I'd like to bring to your attention. First, uh, the efforts that Joe Reason is doing in navigation are, uh, are, are, are bringing us dividends today, both in our focus on ensuring that we have a common computer program across multiple platforms, positioning our hardware to accept that common computer pro computing program, and getting to a long-term arrangement where we look to a navigation suite of equipment that we might be able to compete 
across multiple industry partners. In Aegis, uh, we, have we have achieved uh, massive amounts of success with the common source library where the same baseline that we're using to modernize our ships today, baseline nine, is the same baseline that we will put in new construction when we, when, uh, when, uh, we begin with those ships. Uh, it, is a, it is a remarkable achievement. We've never, before, uh, we've never before been able to focus that. And you look across what we're doing with baseline nine, whether it's uh, cruisers, destroyers, uh, new construction, or in fact, Aegis Ashore, the, uh, the reuse of that code is well above 95% across multiple applications and, uh, and achieving massive success. SSDS, the same. Their single source library has ensured that the code reuse between multiple classes of ship is, again, above 90% and, and getting better. We are, we are seeing in applications and how we shoot ESSM, how we shoot RAM, it's the same, regardless of whether we're going to shoot it from a, uh, from a large deck amphib or whether it's an aircraft carrier. And the computing program, the, re the reuse of that code is, uh, is exactly the same. Uh, Admiral Copeman, in his presentation the other day, brought up the presentation to the sailor with common functions ought to be the same. I am proud to report we are embarked upon an effort for ASW air controllers, where how an, how an anti-submarine helicopter or a heli helicopter in an anti-submarine mission is being controlled is the same whether that air controller is on an aircraft carrier or whether he's on an Aegis ship. That ASTAC module resident in, in a baseline, uh, in, in an ACB-16 or in ACB-16 of SSDS will be the same. So the presentation to the sailor at the glass, the buttons he pushes, will be the same in that, in that tactical uh, application of that capability. More importantly, how we raise anti-submarine tactical air controllers through that training, through those school, that schoolhouse, how we train them in, in the ship will be the same, regardless of the, uh, of the baseline or of the computer program that he's operating from. Uh, in Aegis and SSDS, there are other successes that I'd like to highlight. The Joint Track Manager, which is how we take in vehicular tracks uh, from our various sensors. That Track Manager module inside those computing plants are the same. That module is the basis for how we handle tracks and gives us the opportunity to create other examples of commonality as we go forward. Uh, and and it, it is a tremendous force multiplier. We are at the, at the uh, uh, cross, or we are actually delivering uh, common displays and common processing to sailors across the multiple uh, instantiations of ships, uh, again, amphibs, cruisers, and destroyers. Uh, ESSM that, uh, that Jack Knoll is, uh, is working very hard on, uh, the new Block uh, 2 missile that we're uh, just embarked on, uh, on creating, that, uh, that missile will have uh, the, the rocket motor, is, uh, is absolutely the same as what we'll see in, uh, or the, the propulsion system, actually the same as what we'll see in multiple other missiles. But the cards, the, the, uh, the electronics, and the navigation system inside the missile, same as it is in standard missile. So again, how we, uh, at the depot level, how we open those missiles up, how we care for those missiles, how those missiles speak to the ship is the same. That gives us further opportunities for commonality as we proceed to employ those, those uh, capabilities. Uh, I talked to you about uh, uh, the Joint Track Manager Common Displays. That's uh, a work of uh, some very fine captains and civilians in Tom Drugan, John Hill, and, uh, and Bob Shavak. What they are doing there is not, a, is not ascending to any mandate. They're just doing common sense engineering, what IWS was created to do. Future candidates, I think, uh, I think there is much more room to do in navigation, and we are focused there, so we get to that navigation suite. We are far from ready to do that. We are having inquiries with industry, but, uh, but I can tell you that, uh, that we very much want to get to a part where we can compete a suite of equipment and, uh, and look more broadly instead of trying to uh, address a speed log issue, address an anemometer, address a DRT. We're looking at broader swaths of 
equipment that we can, uh, bundle's a bad word, but that we can uh, collect together and then, uh, and then compete. Surface search radars, we have multiple different instantiations of that radar and we are moving out with the SPS 73 to get that common and ensure performance is, uh, is in accordance with the dictate required by the resource sponsors. And then lastly, a standard missile. A standard missile offers us multiple opportunities, not just with weapons inside Navy, but also with AMRAM and opportunities for commonality among services. And that's where we're going. And we have uh, our obsolescence program, a program which looks at the life cycle of that missile and how we would manage obsolete parts right now. We are, uh, we are largely taking the cue from the program manager of the Air Force, who has a very robust obsolescence management program with our uh, industry partner and one we are looking to manage together. So the future is bright. We, uh, we didn't get here overnight. We won't have this fixed by Friday, but I can tell you that uh, there is tremendous effort, not just in IWS, but throughout with our partners in the various PEOs and, uh, and resource sponsors and fleet staffs to ensure that uh, we've gotten the message and we're work working very hard to achieve that variance reduction. Thank you. Great, great, Joe. And, and uh, I think you're bringing to life what integrated warfare systems was intended to do at, at it as, as it was created. Uh, last topic is, is about the basic sailor maintenance plan, maintenance system. The baseline that Dave Gale's operating on when he takes a ship into the avail is that the PMS is done. The training and, and uh, readiness of those radar systems is essential in the PMS, and yet sailors don't like it and the leaders don't like it. So what uh, Mark's going to talk about is the significant effort that we've undertaken and more to do on making PMS better. Go ahead, Mark. Thank you, Admiral. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, so I'm going to keep this uh, short and simple, which is the way PMS should be. So I'm going to be consistent in that regard. Um, so it's my intention to, to talk to you about the issues that we're hearing, what we're getting as feedback. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about what we're doing about it right now uh, and in the, the foreseeable future, and then give you a sense of what that future vision looks like. So as the Admiral mentioned, uh, it's clear, uh, and a source of the information was from the Reducing Administrative Distractions uh, Initiative, the, the sailors uh, are definitely giving us the feedback that, that PMS is, is overly burdensome and it's complicated and, and it should not be. Uh, and that's uh, a couple of different perspectives. So from the force revisions, it takes a lot of hours uh, at the work center supervisor to, to get the, the force revision implemented, go through all the changes, understand everything that's there. From the actual MRCs, the actual cars that are going down there, there's a lot of steps, there's a lot of notes, a lot of cautions. It is just a lot of extra work for them to get the work done. Uh, and also one of the feedbacks was, uh, and being the father of twin teenage sons uh, that are very visual and tactile, um, I'd like to see a handheld. Why can't I have a handheld? Why can't I take something down there and, and use that to do my PMS? And so we're listening to that as well. From the TICOM's perspective, uh, the, we've gone to the, the very generalized PMS because it's easier that way. So what we've lost is we've lost the, the configuration-based PMS and that multi-configuration um, documents. It just makes it hard from a policy perspective um, from the fleet, that broad um, kind of shift in the mentality such that the, across TICOMs it's a little bit difficult to handle, handle from a policy perspective. Uh, the documentation, again, is complicated. It, it doesn't work well in uh, largely distributed command structures, uh, LCS, LCS RON, uh, where the ships are going to be. It just makes it a challenge for them to handle it. The inconsistencies in the schedules uh, is a challenge. Uh, and the P PMS feedback screening, the, the way that we get it back in headquarters, uh, there's, there's work that we can do that, uh, that makes it easier such that the answers are not as costly nor time consuming. Um, and that, again, from the, from the fleet perspective, some of the ambiguity and the expense that it incurs on getting maintenance done. So what are we working on? Uh, so right now what we're working on is policy, uh, we're working on process, and we're working on tools all at the same time. So in process right now from a policy perspective is standing up a fleet requirements uh, management board 
Uh, all the stakeholders are involved. The intention there is to make sure that what we're working on is prioritized and the right things that matter most. Um, the configuration board at NAVC is going to be kind of the oversight piece of that and make sure that we're driving the change in, a, in an expeditious manner. Um, one of the first things to do is to work on that distributed policy and institutionalize it within the Joint Fleet Maintenance Manual. Within the process, tackling the MRC cards, taking those cautions, taking the overly prescriptive PPE hazmat and making them such that they're simple the step-by-step -step and maybe some pictures in it, something that the, the sailors can take and actually go execute so that we're executing the maintenance at the right place, at the right time, at the right level. This is also where we start moving towards that configuration-based PMS. This is where we will start moving down the decentralized or the, the, uh, the, the generalized PMS and start getting it to where it's hull-specific something tied to the uh, configuration records of that ship, uh, and I'll touch on that here in just a second. For the tools, SCED 3.2, moving in the right direction from where we are right now. The plan right now is to have SCED 3.2 in all of the ships that are, it's planned to be on by the end of this year, um, fiscal year, just so we're clear, fiscal year, and that's either live and or in training mode. Um, and so that's a big leap forward. That is, uh, that is also going to be able to give the, the leadership on board a, a different dashboard uh, so that they have some metrics to see how, uh, how the maintenance is being done. Um, another aspect of that is tailored force revisions. This is where we are starting to do more of the work shoreside before it gets out to the ship so it reduces the, the, uh, the burden, the administrative burden to implement those things that are changing. And it's giving, like I said, it's giving us some opportunity to get some different looks at different metrics, both uh, on board the ship and, and how the quality of the PMS is working out. So what's the future look like? It is configuration-based PMS. It is tied to the ship. Can you picture a day where there are no more lineouts? There's, uh, there's uh, no force revisions. There, it's simple, it's done shoreside, it's continuous revisions, so it's not tied to specific time frames, um, and it gives us a good complete history of the maintenance that's being done on that ship. Web-based, integrated metrics, things that will help both ship and shoreside make sure that the maintenance is being done right at the right time. Um, and it also allows us to go down that road a little bit further with the handheld device, which we will pilot as part of the RAD program, but this is an opportunity here when, when we get the, the IT piece of it in moving in the right direction. So that's uh, 3M in a snapshot. Uh, we've heard it, we're working on it, and we're going to make it better, better, short, sweet, and to the point. That's it, Great, sir. Great. Thanks, Mark. So uh, what, what you heard here is not anything really wildly new. What we're mostly going to do, this is about discipline and execution. Almost all the policies are already in place. Uh, all of the boards and meetings are already there. We need execution, a cop and a cop. And so uh, with that, uh, let me just stop. Uh, we present a lot of data across a, across a broad spectrum, but, but ultimately the success of the OFRP will be on whether we can get our ships modernized and maintain in a timely manner and whether the sailors can keep them up uh, in between those maintenance periods. And so we'll stand by to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Well, first off, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, it's an excellent presentation. Kurt Warden from Nova Power Solutions. We're a subcomponent supplier across multiple syscoms. And what I would, I'm going to address PMS first because it was the last subject. So uh, <laughs> the, uh, one of the things I've noticed is that on our component, uh, the maintenance requirement, even the periodicities on those requirements, are different between systems. Um, and can you talk to us about what efforts are being made to make common components have common maintenance requirements? 
So that's going to be that will be within the purview of what we're going to be looking at once we move forward with the, the configuration based PMS is looking for consistent PMS on consistent components consistently. Did I, yeah, I, that's right. About right. right. Yeah. Um, so um, so that is a, that is recognized as a, an area uh, that needs work because even uh, differences between ships. Uh, we, we have found that we've got differences there. And so we, we will tackle that, your specific concern, as we move forward, for but, sure. But there is, there is one, one point on that, it would be is the, the main component that it's attached to may actually be the driver. So that, that could be the difference. Yeah. But it should be as consistent as it can be. Right. Actually, you could actually probably save quite a bit of money if you use the same maintenance procedure from piece to piece, and rather than rewriting it, just right. lift it from one and move it into the other. No, nope, absolutely so. agree with that. So. Gentlemen, thank you. Great, thanks. Seifert. Uh, Admiral Copeman, in his brief, mentioned uh, condition-based maintenance a couple of times and talked about um, the need to implement not just on uh, new construction ships, but to put it back on legacy vessels as well. When it came to the PMS side, I didn't see CBM mentioned. So how does that fit into your planning to be able to streamline PMS and make it easier for sailors to maintain their ships? Uh, so CBM, CBM Plus is, is absolutely part of it. It's connected. It, I, I'd say it runs, it'll run in the background. But uh, that's, that's something that's also under my purview is NAVCO4. And we've got, a, we've got a separate initiative going forward to backfit um, the ability to get that data off the ships. So we are working on that specifically. But the condition-based maintenance requires data. Right. And what we, what we lack at this moment is the data actually to go fully implement it. Right. So it's collecting that data is be an important part of all that. So yeah, great, great question. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time this morning. Max Cooper, PMS 339 Surface Training Systems. As we start talking about future surface combatants and starting to truly develop a ship that is a product of modern server technology and software capabilities, how do you see the modernization process changing in terms of having to simply update the computer program versus having to actually swap out the hardware in order to get the increased capability that we're going to need as these ships go through their life cycle? So, yeah, let me, let me take a first stab and then I'll, I'll, I'll let both, uh, both these guys. From my point of view, the as there's an asynchronous, you had an asynchronous problem. The ship and the physical infrastructure of the ship is on a 30, 35 year cycle. And every time you pull out the welding torches, you're talking big money. The hardware is on a four to six year cycle, depending on which server uh, farm you buy, which, which part of the, the, the system you buy from, but four to six years. And then your software might be on the six month cycle in response to an urgent fleet need to change the electronic warfare posture of the ship. I think you had to take into account that asynchronous nature of those three things and separate them. Uh, get the physical infrastructure right to host common hardware. Get the software right so that it can be hosted on that, that common hardware. And, and you'll have achieved the kind of, the kind of alignment of those things uh, that, that is possible. It is possible to do it. It's really hard, but I think uh, both Admiral Horn and Admiral Gale are working towards that, uh, that broad thought. Do you, do you have a and I'll, uh, from a policy perspective, I'll tell you that uh, Mark Whitney and I have had uh, conversations already about the need to evolve Navy modernization policy such that we're not treating software changes uh, that are non-ship impacting, especially where availability is a concern, and feel that stuff in different ways at different times. Uh, then we feel the ship impacting alterations, which are, you know, heavy moving parts, cutting, welding, yeah. wrench turning kind of work. Today, they're treated the same. They needed to be treated differently so that we can field them more effectively on the software side. From, a, from the software perspective, I think key to, uh, to what you're speaking of is the ability that uh, some of the attributes that we see in the common source library and the single source library where we are almost in a continuous stage of development. Checking capability out of the library, working it, developing it, testing it, checking it back into the library. And then when that opportunity opens up, we're able to pull from that common source library and get it in the ship in a very, uh, in a very, a lot smoother fashion than heretofore. Great, thanks. Thank you.
So in the near future, we expect the administration to release a new uh, national security strategy. We also expect the results of the QDR to come out. And uh, Congress has offered some relief to sequestration, but certainly not as much as we had hoped. So I'm wondering how, from a policy perspective, how your plans, uh, how you think these external factors are going to impact you this year in terms of readiness and in years ahead. Yeah, I think uh, that's a great question. And, and predicting the future has uh, the, the typical uh, uh, pitfalls I'll attempt to avoid. I would say regardless of the financial outlook, there is, uh, I think, adequate resources in the readiness accounts if they're applied properly. That is, the discipline we're talking about, applied well, executed uh, as predicted, will result in there being adequate resources for readiness. If we don't get this done, we'll continue to under-resource readiness. And so I, I believe that the answer is there's enough there, we got to go execute. And if we execute, we'll actually save money and be able to fit within those uh, declining budgets. But that, yeah, go ahead. I would, to echo the Admiral's words, uh, absolutely right. Regardless of where we are with uh, financial uncertainty, I think this is an imperative because we, uh, as I said before, all this in terms of weapon system commonality, that variance is balanced on the backs of our sailors. We can't do that any longer, regardless of how much money we have. Did I answer your question, or do you want, to, you want another bite at that apple? Uh, I think so. I, I, certainly uh, these factors, particularly sequestration, I think will limit significantly what you all are able to do. Uh, it will certainly impact the plans and, and execution. Um, so, but, but I think you also you make the point is our, our Navy has never been in, more in demand and, uh, and uh, whether it be things going on in the Mediterranean or in the Persian Gulf or out in the Western Pacific. Uh, those 284, 85 ships we have today have to be made to last to their service life or beyond, as Admiral Gale indicated. That is the least cost solution to a, the largest possible Navy. So that, that path goes straight through the middle of what we were talking about. Thanks. Thanks Thank for the question. Appreciate it. Good morning, Admirals. Uh, Chris Barrett with Delta Resources. First off, thanks for your service and thanks for your active engagement with industry. A uh, question uh, I have, maybe a slight variation on the theme, but I, I think we can agree that there is a cycle of, of lessons learned and, and enterprise evolution, if you will, that, uh, you know, that indicated by where we were and where we are now. And while we can debate the frequency of that cycle, the fact remains <coughs> that uh, that it's there, and, and it's driven by any number of, of factors, emergent factors such as you know budgetary perturbations, uh, world events, and demand on assets, political influences, uh, changes in the industrial base, and so on and so forth. But I think that there are a, a few overarching uh, factors that uh, that drive us to where we are. I mean, we we are not where we are now by accident, and, and you consider such things as uh, appropriations and the, and the restrictions that that places on our flexibility to achieve some of the objectives you've laid out here from SCN to OMEN to OPN, uh, enterprise organizational structure that drives acquisition strategies and contracts and, and even such things as configuration management systems and so on and so forth, that handoff there. So uh, what do you see as the barriers to objectives and, and how do you either break through those barriers or work around them to achieve the, some of the objectives you've laid out? Uh, I'll start and, and say that, and I, I think uh, Dave Gale probably talked about it the most, is that uh, for the last couple of years, although we've put a lot of money into the, into the maintenance accounts, it hasn't always been executed well. And as we looked at it, much of it was due to the uncertainty right around the first of the year. So you get to the point of uh, beginning to execute the next fiscal year, you're on a sequestered baseline, you're on a, on a continuing resolution, and that results in a smaller dollar amount than you had hoped to have and that maybe you planned for. Uh, during the course of the run-up to that point, there's a, a tendency to reach into that planning, that planning on, that was on uh, Admiral Gale's chart, and, and pull things out, and then the money comes, oh, no, it looks like we're going to have a budget, and it goes back in. And as a result, the planning product that goes into the start of that avail it was all over the map. Uh, and we took all the tanks out because of the last budget drill, and now all the tanks come back in and now go execute that avail on the schedule you, you uh, said. Uh, we're going to go try to create the machine 
that takes that into account. That is, plan almost with your blinders on. So plan the avail with all the engineered maintenance, with all the modernization that was in the budget, all the way up to the point of issuing the RFP to the contractor who's going to do the maintenance. And on that day, we have the big meeting. We say, how much money is there? And invariably, over the last couple of years, on that day, there's almost always been enough money for the avail if we had fully planned it. And in some cases, it's, well, I know you descoped it, but put it all back in. And what that results then is in execution, you're executing a plan you didn't create, you know, that you didn't create, could have. And, and as a result, we struggle to get through those avails, and it happens over and over again. And so what we're, we're going to do is say, no, we're going to plan and, then, and provide transparency of that plan. And then on the day you've got to decide is that's the day to decide the final scope. Then issue the RFP and go down and execute that maintenance. That takes into account that variance, that, that, that sine wave that you talked about. If we can execute that process and execute it well, We'll plan those avails, and in, in my case, in, in, uh, my assertion would be that in almost every case, the fleet will have the money on that day, and we'll execute those avails well and support the OFRP. So we're, we're trying to change the dynamic by, not by changing the system that got us there, but by, by adapting to it and, and presenting a system that, that, a process that'll work repeatably, regardless of whether you have a budget on 1 October or not. I'll also add, um, you know, on the left-hand side of, of, um, of the business of planning, uh, anything prior to the year of execution where we can stabilize a requirement, we kind of enter the year of execution in a relatively, I'll say, good place if we take advantage of everything we know. As I said earlier, uh, we don't do that very well and we need to do that. In the year of execution, when, as Admiral Hallard said, things get a little wacky, um, Where's the governance of what's really going to happen with those availabilities? It's got to be a lot more than just somebody waving their hand over and saying, plan it like you're going to get it, when in reality, I am taking work out, putting work in, taking work out, putting work back in, because the controls on that availability truly in the system are changing. And when you talk about making those decisions, is it an integrated view between maintenance and modernization? When we make the decision uh, in, in the early days of the fourth quarter that we're going to take first quarter next year availabilities and pull them to the left, we have just taken months out of the planning process, and we never called the modernization guys to say, hey, what's the impact of me doing this to you? Can you do long lead time material procurement? How is your planning affected? Is it going to be integrated in maintenance? What's this really going to look like in execution? And so it's truly at the flag level, and I'll say at the flag level, there has to be a governance structure put into this business that nobody gets a chance to go reach in and pull a lever or point at somebody and give them direction without us all agreeing that that was a good thing or because we have to do it that we understand what the real impacts are going to be in execution because that's often forgotten until we get into execution. Everybody looks up and goes, holy crap. What did we do to ourselves here? That's a technical term. Yeah, so, yeah uh, and it works. Uh, and, uh, and, then, and then we're trying to fix it on the downswing, and we can't. It's ugly. It's poorly executed. It comes out late, and everybody's dissatisfied with what's happened. So I would say just roll it back. There has to be put in place, if we're going to win, an accountability and a governance structure that allows us to make decisions collectively in the rugged environment we're trying to operate in so that we all know how we got there. All right? That's my point. Thanks. I was having a rodent class and I don't go on record. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Laura Seligman from Inside the Navy. Um, so you had um, about, due to sequestration in the CR, you had about a $3 billion shortfall in ship maintenance going into 2014. I was wondering what uh, those numbers look like now. and. Um, do you think you're going to be able to do all of the scheduled maintenance in 2014? Wow. I don't know if I've got insight. I, actually, that. I don't think I have. I don't have insight into that. Yeah, we, don't, one yet. we don't really. Although the Congress has decided, I don't think they told us. But yet. Erica Plath is here. She yeah. knows the answer. Eric, go ahead. <laughs> what? Well, what was the answer, Erica? 
So it looks like, Everything's and, and it kind of goes to, goes to the point I was making, is up until this moment, I couldn't have told you, for just the reasons you said. If we had planned well, sort of with our blinders on to this point, those avails would all be well planned and we'd have a chance of executing them well. We did, we, we reacted to those budget drills, we modified those avails, we took it out, we put it back in, and as a result, we won't be as good in 2014 as we could have been if we'd had that discipline. So I, you made my point, thank you very much, I appreciate it. <laughs> good morning, Admirals, thanks for being here. Good to hey, see Johnny, you, again, sir. You? Terrific. A uh, question, if I could, probably for Admiral Gale and Admiral Whitney. When you look at the uh, C4ISR installations and the modernization there, how can you talk about the collaboration and how tightly in the processes that's working across the seams and maybe even to naval aviation? And for Admiral Whitney, is is there a a, a, a mechanism by which you're talking about the commonality of presentation for what on the maintenance side we call PMS, on the IT side is probably configuration control and management from a day-to-day. Uh, network security point of view, uh, the way that is presented to the sailors, so it's common uh, when you get into equipment, people understand that process commonly across the IT guys and the uh, uh, fire control guys. Yeah, great, thanks. So let me let me just uh, cross this com. Uh, the idea of reestablishing the ship program manager authorities, as uh, Admiral Gale talked about, uh, they they they've heard those words, they've nodded to those words. I, I don't think they've really met that person yet, and when they do, they'll probably less, be less happy about it. But I think Admiral Horn said it best, is when you establish that discipline and you make it clear that you're not going to bend on it, that it's going to be real discipline, very quickly the program managers will respond and react and align. I know uh, Admiral Brady uh, is, is committed to it, although there's always that asterisk, except when the fleet says, no, i got to have that all. Uh, and, and that's, I think, to, to what Admiral Gale said, is that we still have to be able to override when we have to override. But it should be the exception, not the rule, and today it's the other way around. It's the rule, not the exception. So, yeah, no, you I know you And I, I will say, um, it, it really is, going back, I'll use the term spin, but it, in a bigger sense, it's about how you lead the problem. Uh, I was in a conversation yesterday uh, regarding a Keynes install on a carrier. And it was a conversation happening months before the avail starts that should have happened two years ago. Two years ago, we should have been debating what it was going to take to do that work. We, areas of success, if I can go from C4 to C5, I'll just say C5. Uh, I, you know, we have, I think, relatively high success today in fielding Aegis modernization. It's because we lead the problem years in advance in the planning and in the programming, in the in the detailed effort that goes into making sure that a multiple, a, 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 I'll say, a, a multiple set of SCDs combined is just modernization. That we understand how it's wired together and how it's going to integrate in the availability and how we're going to execute that. That whole idea of leading that problem, like we do in just modernization, into things like capstone, canes, and anything else that's ship impacting. We've got to pull that conversation to the left, like I said in my cone chart. You know, at 720, we should be having, you know, very detailed discussions about specific modernization packages on a ship and talking about what's going to integrate well, what may not fit. Do we need to buy more duration? What, what maintenance is planned and how is that going to integrate? So that, you know, when Admiral Gortney, you know, truly, you know, in the end wants his ship back on time, that what we did two years prior to that delivered on that. And it's not just we'll fix it on the downswing or we'll just add months to the availability uh, because that's what we need to do because we didn't plan it right. So uh, you said C4, I, I say it goes to everything. Pull it to the left, lead it from the front, we can win the fight, but SPIMs have to, have to be out there doing that. So. Did you have a... You want to take a stab at the other part of that? I'll take a stab at it, and, and if my answer is not appropriate or good, then Mr. Andy Kelly is here in the front row, and he's the program manager. So anybody else has a 3M question, you can flash mob him afterwards. So to, to get to your, uh, your, your question, uh, to me it's as simple as just getting, we got to get down into the technical details and, and no kidding, go down to the specifics. We've generalized. It's time to go back and getting getting down into the details and the specifics by component and making sure that we got it right. Thanks, that gets you. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks, Tony. 
It looks like we're almost out. We're out of microphones. Oh, we got one more. I think. Thank you, sir. Uh, Calvin Foster with TASC. We've been assisting NSWC Port Wanimi and PEO IWS with information assurance authority to operate challenges on the self-defense test ship, and we see a lot of, of uh, difficulties that that brings to the table, that requirement brings to the table, along with cyber readiness inspections. Um, do you, how, do, how do you address those kind of challenges at, at your level, and how do you see going forward um, the intricacies of the combat systems and integrated information systems, uh, and how you kind of plan maintenance and operations uh, readiness for that? Thank you. Thanks, sir. <laughs> uh, for us, at the end of the day, <clears throat> inside the combat system, it's all about executing a fire control loop. The issue that we have with information assurance, largely today, and, and this is being actively worked, I don't want to leave you with just the problem, but the issue that we have today is a lot of the solutions that we bring to information assurance are business solutions and not focused on making sure that we can keep a 4 hertz update rate to the standard missile or whatever is required in order to execute that fire control loop. We're not about, it's not a business solution that we're after. Uh, we acknowledge that there are issues. We certainly acknowledge that those issues have to be addressed. Uh, but we, we are embarked upon uh, multiple efforts to ensure the business of the combat system can be accomplished while we looked at those various protective measures both inside the, the domains of the combat system and outside on those boundaries to protect what's inside. From, a, uh, from the perspective of uh, modernization, our, uh, our perspective as IA is a, is, is, is a um, uh, very, uh, very forthright but, but also very cumbersome in execution of the paperwork required from an IATO to complete certification. There is an awful lot of steps that have to be accomplished there. As Admiral Gale said, we just need to lead turn. We, we understand that process. We just need to lead turn it so that we're not uh, presented at, at an inappropriate time with, uh, hey, we still got 17 steps left and only time for 12 of them to make. I'll just add one, one piece of that, is that the, the total IT infrastructure of the ship, which includes combat systems, navigation systems, and then the, just the regular lands that you run PMS SCED 3.2 on, uh, that, that broadly, uh, if you understand its configuration and, and build it to the configuration, and then keep the switches internal to the system set to the switch positions that were specified when it was designed, those systems are highly defensible, even the older ones. What happens is we've broadly lost control, in many cases, of the configuration of that IT infrastructure. Too many other things have been connected to it. Too many other switch positions have been modified to make those things happen. And so in modernization, simplification that gets you a, a, a relatively straightforward to operate ship's land like Keynes is when it's up and operational will help with that to a great measure. But ultimately, there's a discipline piece here, both in the configuration of the ship and then the maintenance of the, I'll call the software configuration uh, that's installed on the ship. So thank you very much for that question. Thank I you, think sir. that's our last question, Ken. Yes, Admiral, that, uh, that is. I want to thank you uh, for some really informative and terrific presentations and for your candid responses during the Q&A period. But more important than that, I want to thank all of you and your commands for what you do each and every day to support surface force readiness. Thank you.